she gets. So. Today, yeah. people would say, um, you know, you first have to learn how to write it. So, you know, you sit in classes and take courses and that sort of thing. Well, they all, they have my sympathy, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine having to learn how to write. You teach yourself. Well, I have a terrible prescription. I don't know if I dare say it. Maybe all the television sets will go off in Germany. Not really. You have to read and read and read if you want to be a writer. Do these contemporary writers like Michael Crichton, for example, who's very successful, do they have influence on your writing? There is commercialism, which is always with us, popular fictions, and they have a use, if only as a sort of manure for films. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there is literature, which is something quite different, and which is losing its audience. In the 50 years since my first novel, uh, I have watched um, the public for serious literature just get smaller and smaller and smaller in every country. And Mailer and I, we saw each other last year. We were both complaining about um, what had happened in our lifetime. When we started, not only were we quite famous in the culture, but literature was famous in the culture. And we came, we were the next generation after Hemingway and Faulkner. We just thought it would go on and that we were taking the places of uh, the elder writers as they died off. Well, we did, but there was no place left. There was no interest. <laughs> and he said, well, Gore, he said, one thing we know about us, about the future, you and I are going to be cults. Cults, he said. I said, Norman, that may satisfy you to be a cult, but I expect it to be a major religion, and I'm not satisfied with mere cult status. I said this on television a couple of weeks ago in England to Salman Rushdie. We were being interviewed together, <laughs> and Rushdie said, and I said, I want to be a major religion. Rushdie said, and so do I. Oh my God, what have I said? <laughs> up here I said that this is a place where you lose fear are you afraid of your death well death is an abstraction either you're here or you're not if you're here you're not dead and if you're dead you're not here and uh, you are wherever it was you were before you were born which presumably is nothing it's the mess of getting to death which I nearly came to um, last year and I had an enormous by accident it turned out but an internal hemorrhage and I was bleeding to death and I remember thinking uh, how pleasant it is. This was the Romans' preferred way of suicide, cutting their wrists in a hot tub. Well, you feel your blood going, and uh, you just get terribly sleepy, and it's a wonderful sleepiness. It's like a perfect valium. And uh, the only unpleasant, you get slightly nauseated. But I was mostly angry uh, about the mess. And then we found four, at four in the morning, and we found uh, four kids from the piazza, and they carried me into the ambulance and off to the emergency hospital, and I'd lost one half of my red blood supply. And I uh, knew exactly what it was like, at least to bleed to death. And I thought, this really isn't bad at all. Uh, the thought of being dead, is, as you get older, isn't... There must be those who fear it, but I'm, I don't know many old people who do. You've got used to the idea, pretty much, by the time you get to 70. If you would be young today, you know, with your attitude towards sexuality, do you think you would change it, knowing about AIDS now? Well, I would have to, but um, if, I, if I had grown up knowing about this, this extraordinary danger, I would have been a different person, probably. But I'm, as I told you, I was writing, I'm writing about Kennedy now, and uh, we both came out of the war. And each of us was like the idea of having a different person uh, for sex each, every day. 
Now, of course, you're supposed to be, oh, how awful, how cold and immature and so forth and so on. Yes, but it's wonderful fun, and that's the way we were designed by nature, was to do this. And I don't regret a minute of it. I'm sure his ghost doesn't regret any of it either. I find I found very interesting in your in your biography was that the Kennedy clan definitely had a mafia connection mm. and they were definitely involved in organized crime and in some interview you said there would come out a book proving that well that's the book that I am now reviewing it's by right. Seymour Hirsch called the dark side of Camelot they were indeed a mafia family for three generations it goes back to the president's um, grandfather Fitzgerald, the mayor of Boston, who was the great bootlegger, as mayor, all the illegal alcohol went through the mayor's office, and he had a young Italian uh, assistant from New York called Frank Costello, who later became the head of the entire mob in the United States. So how do you see the connection of organized crime and politics today? It costs $25 million dollars to get to be a senator from the state of California. Well, for in the last election for president, roughly one billion dollars was spent by the Republican Dole and one billion by the Democrat Clinton. Well, you don't get a billion dollars from just nice little people, uh, uh, from nuns out of their savings. You get it from organized crime. And what's rather worse, to my mind, from the great conglomerates, far more dangerous than mere crime. Don't you feel the urge sometimes to go back to politics? I think that I have more influence as myself than I would have if I were in the Senate. It's far better that I go out and uh, speak to five, ten thousand people at Harvard of, and get to young people who will in turn become perhaps future senators or presidents even and give them ideas. I think that is far more powerful. Mm -hmm.